You know, if there's one question I get asked more than any other, more even than, why do they say taking a dump when aren't you really leaving it? That question would have to be, Mark, can you make art with an Olympus Camedia C4000 Zoom Digicam from 2002? Well, today we're going to try and answer that question. Yes, it's Christmas. Think of this as my Christmas gift to you. But unlike those socks you got last year, you can't repurpose this video and give it to one of your in-laws. Instead, we're going to tackle one of the big questions. What is art? So buckle up and come with me on a philosophical foray into the field of photography to discover the essence of art with a capital A. First of all, don't expect an in-depth discussion about whether photography is art. Of course, the fact that Ted Forbes' YouTube channel is called The Art of Photography has decisively concluded that discussion. At the same time, I'm not going to claim that all photography is art. My snapshot of a brick wall is not the same as Jeff Wall, and my Martin is definitely subpar. But if I learned anything through years of getting my PhD, it's that stringing together a few well-chosen quotes can be an adequate substitute for any kind of coherent thesis. After all, it was Aristotle who said, art completes what nature cannot bring to a finish. The artist gives us knowledge of nature's unrealized ends. And that's always resonated with me. I mean, think about it. Firstly, it makes it sound like we're almost godlike in that somehow we're improving on what is actually there. But secondly, it also acknowledges that nature is messy and complex and there's something about photography that is consciously selective, reductive even. And that rationalization can make you see things in new ways. So, uh, look, I know in my own photography, I find myself constantly trying to remove things from the scene. To impose my own need for order on it is probably why I photograph the built environment more than nature. Nature, let's face it, is pretty chaotic and meaningless when you stop and uh, think about it. So art can transcend nature. But what does it tell us? Is it a harbinger of truth? Well, Picasso said art is a lie that makes us realize truth. But then Theodore Adorno argued art is magic delivered from the lie of being truth. Not sure that helps much, particularly when you reflect on Marcel Duchamp's characterization of art as the missing link, not the links which exist. It's not what you see that is art. Art is the gap. So art is everything and nothing. A truth that lies and a lie that is true. And you've got to wonder if artists are kind of taking the piss, probably literally in Duchamp's case, given that his most famous work is the urinal. But like Duchamp's fountain, there is something about art that lasts beyond the moment in which it was created. According to Hippocrates, I'm really running the gamut of the different theorists, art is long, life is short. Ars longa vita brevis. The work stands beyond the person that makes it. They are the creative spawn, the legacy that we leave for others. And speaking of spawn, over the years, I've mated with lots of cameras. I'm kind of a photographic floozy, a streetwalker, literally making picture babies, all with various DNA combinations and an inherent lack of consistency and style. And so it makes sense that the camera that you use is going to inf influence the end product. Oils and a spatula are going to make a different picture than brush and watercolors. Similarly, the work that you produce is a reflection of where you are, when you are, and who you are. It's an interplay of light, subject, and of your own life and vision. Now, Edward Munch is quoted as saying, what is art? Art grows out of grief and joy, but mainly grief. Yes, I have suffered for my art, and now it's your turn. But first, let me introduce you to the camera. Bertolt Brecht said, art is not a mirror held up to reality, but a hammer with which to shape it. Please, YouTube, if I can find it, meet today's hammer of choice, the Olympus C4000Z. It arrived in 2002, not the first in its class. This was really, uh, I guess, a sequel to the very successful C2000 and C2020 and its successor, the C3000. 
3020Z that came a year before this one. It also has a slightly higher end stable mate, the C4040 zoom, but that has an f1.8 lens. Now the C4000 was 499 US dollars on release. And I picked this one up secondhand for 20 Australian dollars. And that makes me smile, although I'm still looking for that Leica in my local charity store. Back to the lens though. No f1.8 here. This one goes from f2.8 to f11 and has a 32 to 96 millimeter equivalent three times zoom, 3.3 times digital, but you're never gonna use that. It has a four megapixel CCD sensor. Now that sounds primitive, but it was 25% more pixels than the previous model that came before it um, just a year before. And four megapixel can easily produce 14 by 11 inch prints. Let's face it, how many pixels do you really need for Instagram? The intriguing thing about this sensor is that it has uh, a legacy CCD sensor rather than the more recent and common CMOS sensors. Some people will tell you there's a magic to CCD sensors and theoretically they could be right. Any common old garden photonic physicist will be able to tell you that charge coupled devices are known to produce high quality, low noise images. The photo sites, they're packed together because they don't have individual transistors and apparently that improves light gathering performance. CMOS sensors, or complementary metal oxide semiconductors, as they're known in the sensor engineering department of Acme Industries. They're a lot cheaper to produce and use a fraction of the power. Fact is the CMOS sensor in your phone is likely to blitz the one here, but there are those that still talk about CCDs as being more filmic in the way that I guess vinyl records are warmer and more soulful. We'll see. In terms of exposure, this has a program mode and six scene settings, allowing a variety of combinations such as portrait, sports, and so on. You can change the metering between center weighted spot and multi metering, the last of which, as far as I can tell, it has the camera do multiple uh, readings in spot mode, and then it kind of averages them out to the best exposure for the scene. I sort of see it a little bit like Nikon's matrix metering, uh, but it's really quite advanced in that it also has aperture and shutter priority modes, as well as full manual exposure including manual focus. So you can also save your settings to four custom modes. And that actually, I think, could provide some kind of use case. Um, I imagine setting up custom mode, for example, where you set your aperture and lock focus uh, zone for street photography. I'm not sure you'd want to be making lots of little changes as you're shooting, though, unless you're keen to dive into the treacly slow menu system. Still, it's nice to have that flexibility. In manual mode, you can go from a thousandth of a second all the way to 16 seconds or one second in program mode. This can shoot a uh, close up with a macro mode of 0.2 meters to 0.8 meters and a super macro mode of 0.8 inches uh, to eight inches. That's two centimeters to 0.2 meters. As you could tell from the intro of this video, it can also shoot video, albeit at postage stamp size and without audio. That was me doing some very clever editing there to get that audio in. One nice feature is that it has an optical viewfinder. Now that isn't really very accurate. It's kind of a throwback, but actually necessary given the low quality of the LCD screen. The screen is also vampirically sucking the life out of the battery every second it's on. And that's a shame because one of the quirks of this camera is that it's a bit faster focusing and taking shots when the LCD screen is on rather than using the optical viewfinder. But let's be honest, this is not a speed demon. It takes seven seconds to start up and then throws a fit because you left the lens cap on. That's going to cause you to miss shots. Now you could be framing that decisive moment of your baby's first smile. And by the time the picture's taken, he's six foot tall, giving you the finger and telling you that he's impregnated the babysitter. So let's call this a contemplative camera. One that causes you to pause and reflect a little, maybe make a cup of tea, have a shower, watch Gone with the Wind before it's good and ready to let you make pictures with it. 
It does have a built-in flash and it has modes for auto flash, auto flash with red eye reduction, fill flash, fill flash with red eye reduction, flash, cancel, slow shutter, synchronization, first curtain effect. I'm reading basically off the spec manual here. Now let's broach the pachyderm in the pantry. This thing takes smart media cards. Now these were brought to the market by Toshiba in 1995. And look, it's actually quite a cool format, wafer thin. It makes compact flash looks prehistoric in comparison. It was really designed as a successor to floppy disks rather than specifically for cameras. And originally they called it SSFDC or solid state floppy disk card. They obviously listen to the marketing department though. Smart media is definitely a lot more catchy. By 20, well, by 2001, nearly half current digital cameras use smart media, but it was quickly replaced by the equally obsolete XD before SD cards came along and just wiped the floor with all of them. Now, sure, you can find smart media readers, but at four times the cost of the camera, I wasn't going that way at all. But it does have one nifty trick up its sleeve. In fact, a few of them. One of them, though, is USB. Okay, Type B mini USB, but USB nonetheless. Now, Type B USB mini is kind of like the sad divorced uncle of USB connectors. Once dominant, but now relegated to drunkenly dancing at the nephew's wedding and hitting on the bride's auntie. Like drunk uncles, though, you can still find USB cables everywhere. Grab one. Plug the camera in, turn it on, and instantly your camera becomes a mass storage device and you can happily drag down the files at turtle next speed. Which brings me to the next issue. It's just as well that this is only a four megapixel camera because you don't get much storage on a smart media card. No raw, just a range of JPEG settings, including a super high quality setting that artificially scales up the image. I guess we'll see how good that is. The only other alternative to JPEG is uncompressed TIFF. Yeah, uncompressed TIFF. On the original 16 megabyte card this came with, you could fit one TIFF image. That's one TIFF image. So it's not exactly practical and uh, they never made smart media bigger than 128 megabyte. Now, one of the biggest issues for obsolete cameras, of course, is, is keeping them powered. Fortunately, this one comes with uh, standard AA batteries or two CRV3 battery packs. I stuck with AA. They don't pack as much power, but seem to last long enough for me when I was shooting from the screen. Um, again, I'm not going to shell out $40 on batteries for a $20 camera. But how does it fare as an art making device? Well, to test it out, I took it on a dog walk around the local suburbs and also shot a few pictures around the house and the garden. Now my garden itself, it's, uh, it's a shrine to the Greek god Hephaestus. According to Wikipedia, he was born congenitally impaired and grew up lame. And I can certainly relate to that last bit. Just as Zeus once banished Hephaestus from Olympus to live among humans for being too ugly to be a god, I wandered the mortal plane of the garden, tiptoeing through the dog turds and detritus to find pearls of artistic beauty to share with you. Let's see how we got on. You will notice the way that I've deliberately composed this shot to contrast the stark geometry of the curb with the spray of petals. I've been reliably informed that the name of this flower is Golden Shower. I kid you not, and the Latin name is Cassia Fistula. Sounds even filthier. I think I've conclusively proven now that porn can be art. And yes, it is Christmas. And how better to celebrate the birth of Christ than string LEDs around to attract young children to your house. That's not creepy at all. Of course, artist that I am to photograph these lit up at night would be mundane, obvious. Instead, I chose an aesthetic dissonance between our expectations of a festive winter wonderland 
with the raw actuality of the blistering Australian sunshine. And of course, I had to sneak this candid wildlife shot of LED reindeer in their natural suburban habitat. Fortunately, my years of ninja experience playing Assassin's Creed meant that I was able to capture the decisive moment before a snapped twig caused this family to scatter and rejoin the flock further down the cul-de-sac. Artists should be generous, magnanimous even, in recognising the talent of others. I hope I did this beautiful work by an anonymous artist on the telephone node, Justice. I paid homage hopefully to the dangerous and disruptive genre that is graffiti art. The words are cryptic. Are they the artist's name? Or do they say, hey, NBN, when the f are you going to install fibre to the premises? Much art depicts the tension between nature and humanity, our desire to bend the beauty of nature to our Nietzschean will. Yet it peeks timidly but resolutely through the gaps in the fences and over the balconies to proclaim its resilience against our oppression. This may well become part of a series that I'll publish as a photo book. Please buy it when it's out. I'll pocket the cash and none of it will go to charity. I'll still call the book Ukraine though. Flowers, of course, are a classic artistic subject. Here, you see me carefully seeking that perfect composition to highlight the proud stem of this plant thingy and remove distractions in the background. I think the final work is a testament to aspiration. The stark purple flowers defy their own ephemerality. They reach longingly towards the blue azure sky, the picture framed perfectly by the foliage that acts as a cortege, if you will, guiding its growth as it processes towards magnificence. Bricks, a celebration of human industry through construction. For this, I wanted to capture the tension between the wall, an impervious and inert, a solid and stolid facade, with loose bricks random and confronting, providing a frisson of potentiality to counter the calm dependability of the interlocking backdrop. I made sure to get on the same level of my subject here, risking everything for that perfect image to create an emotional connection between the subject and the viewer. The sheep's eyes drill through you with piteous clarity, full of both love and admonishment. It's like it's saying to you, I know you're having lamb chops for dinner. Corrugations, maybe, or a sinuous sine wave of steel. Water, the essence of life, trapped in its parabolic grooves. Notice the shallow depth of field and the way I deliberately missed focus. Your eye is being challenged to fall somewhere short of this pool as the lines stretch off into the horizon. You will achieve your end, or will you? Are you destined to stand at the edge of the great rivulets of existence? What is a washing line but a testament to our diurnal cycle of ablution and absolution? Cleansing our souls as we cleanse our clothes. The pegs clutch dish rags and oven mitts like Nepalese prayer flags, wafting in the Himalayan breeze. Another still life. And sure, to you, in your trapped, literal mind, this may be a chair. To an artist, it is so much more. See how the plastic wicker creates a wonderfully abstract geometry, an explosion, a radial paroxysm echoing perhaps the Big Bang or some other cataclysmic event. The chair shakes our soul. We are forced to question the longevity of human existence, 
of the universe even, as well as question if that would actually be very comfortable to sit on. Ask not for whom the bell tolls and apologies to Hemingway, and maybe a little too obvious. I mean, is this really art? Yes. Yes, now it's art. A clock face. Enigmatic. I was going to say timeless, but maybe that's not the right epithet. But what is a photograph but a fixed point in time, a moment? The aim of every artist is to arrest motion, which is life by artificial means and hold it fixed so that a hundred years later when a stranger looks at it, it moves again since it is life. So wrote William Faulkner in the Paris Review. If you're watching this in 2122, I expect you to be suitably moved. Joseph Boys in Art Forum 1969. Even the act of peeling a potato can be a work of art if it is a conscious act. Of course, I don't subscribe to the predictable. Art is about usurping the hegemonic paradigm. No potato peeling here, chopping onions instead. Keeping with the food motif, Sarah Say, interviewed in the New York Times in 2013, said, Art is sustenance. So remember, next time you post your dinner on Instagram, you're making art. And finally, an ode to Marcel Duchamp, an iconic nod to this iconic fountain. The elevation of the ordinary. I did consider taking the photo before I flushed it, but hey, I might save that for my 2024 calendar. In fact, maybe these photos work best as a triptych a three-act gastronomical play in which the protagonist prepares, consumes, and excretes. An eternal cycle, each iteration taking one more step closer to our mortal end. Well, I feel that even the act of sharing this with you has been art. My process laid bare before you inviting you to see the world through my eyes, the pain and beauty of life rendered powerfully through my Olympus C4000Z. But what of this camera? I mean, all pretentiousness aside, it's actually pretty good. Now, around 2001, that was when things really started to take off for digital photography. And by the turn of the century, I was already shooting a lot less film. My kids were born in 1999 and 2000, and I remember using a borrowed Apple Quick Take camera um, to take portraits, well, photos, I guess, of my eldest when she was newborn. I've lost the photos now, but I don't actually remember them being very good. In fact, it's kind of like the first three years of my children's life didn't exist because I don't have any photos. Mind you, I was so sleep deprived, my memories are just a vague shimmer of puke, poo and stewed apple. By the time this camera came out though, I'd already purchased my own digital camera, the Precision Jewel that is the Canon Ixus V. Only two megapixels, but I was able to capture moments for the first time with that same kind of casual indifference that we now feel when we're taking pictures with our phones. A great little camera actually, and let me know if you'd like me to do a comparison video sometime. Anyway, my kids became more papped than Lady Gaga's meat dress, and I vowed never to shoot film again. And that makes sense for a digital media academic. And I did manage to make it work for about 10 years until I slowly got drawn back into the analog miasma of film photography. All you entitled millennials and indolent Gen Zers probably can't imagine how revolutionary it was to actually get a decent picture from a digital camera without the hassle or cost of developing film. I remember seeing a Nikon SLR camera with a Kodak digital back just a few years before this. It cost thousands of dollars and the pictures looked like mush. So yeah, not ready for prime time then. But this is actually usable, not just for 20 years ago, but even today. And it's not perfect, of course. 
One thing this doesn't give you uh, is much room for editing. The resolution and dynamic range, they're just not there. The super high res mode, it's kind of a joke. It gives a modest bump, but like digital zoom, it's interpolated, taking a standard file and increasing the resolution to about 3200 by 2400 in Photoshop, just using automatic sampling, you're going to get as good, if not better results. If you have a look here, we have the Photoshop enlarged image on the left and the in-camera interpolated one on the right. Very little difference. Maybe even a bit more detail on the leaves in the Photoshopped one. I suspect any AI enlargement software, you know, Adobe, Topaz, they're going to give you a better job than this camera will. Let me know what you think. The same goes also with shooting TIFF. It's definitely not a raw file. The sharpness and contrast of the images are baked in. Here you do see a little bit less artifacting in the TIFF file on the left, but is that worth the extra file size? Applying my own Velvia-like preset on the files produces equally ugly results with either of them. You're really best to just live within its limitations. Get what you can in camera rather than trying to do anything in post. So what are the strengths of this camera? Firstly, colors. They have that Olympus punch, nature amped up, which of course is one of our definitions of art. Whether it's the CCD sensor or not, I don't know. I've always loved the colors out of my Olympus cameras. Secondly, the lens, sharp enough and with a decent zoom range. It makes for a versatile camera. It does get a bit soft in the corners. There's some chromatic aberration and a hint of barrel distortion, easily fixed, but the pictures have a kind of presence about them that I think isn't just the sensor. Ergonomically, it feels good in the hand. Everything is kind of in the right place. And this ended up actually being a very popular form factor for lots of cameras of this generation. Finally, it is usable in 2022. As long as you have a smart media card, you won't have to worry about obsolete batteries and connectivity. You can actually put in some double A's, go out, shoot and then easily transfer the photos to your computer. Of course, it has weaknesses. Smart media, obviously. In reality, it'll be one TIFF file or just a handful of JPEGs that you'll be copying over since that's all you can fit on the 16 megabyte card this camera came with. Speed, this is not exactly a sports action camera or suitable for wildlife unless that wildlife is roadkill. And the optical viewfinder, while nice, is not accurate. At least that's my excuse for the crappy framing. Dynamic range, of course, I didn't bracket here, but I would certainly do that if I was shooting any high contrast landscape scene. And it's four megapixels. Obviously, that's a recognized issue. Even in 2002, the super high quality interpolation doesn't really do anything that enlarging in Photoshop wouldn't produce. So it's a limitation. So let's wrap this up. Can you make art with an Olympus C4000Z from 2002? Of course, as long as you subscribe to Oscar Wilde's comment that all art is quite useless, then today, I think I've resoundingly made art. He was, of course, referring to the emotional impact of art rather than its utility, but it's still a phrase I relate to. I am, after all, a living picture of Dorian Gray. I mean, somewhere in a photo album somewhere, there is a trapped, young and handsome version of myself squeaking to be let out. Let me know your own thoughts. What is art to you? Do you have an old camera that you still use? And have you taken any photos with it that you would call art? Leave a comment below. And of course, if you found this video completely useless, then it truly has been art and you should like and subscribe now. I'll leave you with one quote. Ed Ruscha in 2003 said, art has to be something that makes you scratch your head. Whether that means lice or dandruff can be art, I'm not sure. But if you've made it this far and you're scratching your head, then at least I can relax, happy that I have once again climbed the photographic aesthetic pinnacle and I'm looking down on you with the benign but patronizing gaze of an artist. 
knowing that perhaps I have added just a little bit of beauty into your lives and given you some kind of appreciation of what true art is. Later. Tell you what, this is much easier to do when you're halfway through a martini.